Welcome to today's update on flood recovery and on the Coquihalla Highway. Today we have Minister of Public Safety and Solicitor General Mike Farnworth, Minister of Transportation and Infrastructure Rob Fleming, also from that ministry, Regional Executive Director Southern Interior Paula Cousins, and Minister of Agriculture, Food and Fisheries Lana Popham. A reminder to media on the line, please press star 1 to enter the queue. At the conclusion of the updates, you will be limited to one question and one follow-up. With that, over to Minister Farnworth. Thank you uh, and good afternoon. I'm honoured to be here on the traditional territory of the Lekwungen-speaking people and the Songhees and the Squamalt First Nations. I want to start out by saying how proud I am of the strength and resilience of the people of this province. The past weeks have been difficult, but we're making headway in our recovery. As promised, Minister Fleming will be providing an update on the status of our highways. Crews have made incredible progress repairing uh, some of the routes affected by flooding and slide damage. More information on that coming in a moment. But I want to reiterate our gratitude to our work crews for their tireless efforts and ingenuity in very challenging circumstances. On Monday, Minister Fleming, Minister Popham and myself met with the Federal and Provincial Ministers Working Group to outline the progress we're making on the flood recovery. We've discussed what additional supports are needed at the local level and in First Nations and how the Federal Government can continue to ensure British Columbians are covered. We also discussed the commitment to build back from these extreme, event, extreme weather events in a way that better protects British Columbians from future climate events and creates cleaner and healthier communities. Reflecting our shared commitment to the four pillars of emergency management, mitigation, preparedness, response and recovery. And yesterday, as part of their economic update, the federal government announced an initial provision of $5 billion. These initial funds are earmarked to cover their disaster financial assistance arrangement responsibilities and other yet to be determined costs. This is a historic level of funding reflecting the extreme nature of the disaster and the commitment of the federal government to be true partners in this recovery. And officials next steps in the weeks ahead. Assessing the full costs of rebuilding will be an ongoing process and it will be some time before both estimated and final costs can be determined. But having toured the impacted areas, seeing the damage firsthand, I can say that it will be significant. As I said earlier, British Columbians have been through a lot and governments at all levels will continue to supply, provide time. The process of recovering and rebuilding is underway. While it will take time, we will get there. Our government continues to support everyone who's been evacuated. To date, $12.4 million has been dispersed to evacuees by the Red Cross through a variety of channels. And as previously mentioned, starting today, the Red Cross will be providing the ongoing emergency support services to evacuees impacted by the recent floods and extreme weather. I know most evacuees have been in contact with the Red Cross in the last few days. But if you are still under evacuation order and in need of emergency support services and have not yet been in touch, please connect with the Red Cross uh, by phone or in person to ensure ongoing supports will continue. You can reach them by calling 1-800-863-6582 between 8 a.m. and 8 p.m. The Red Cross also has teams available at reception and resiliency centers and commercial lodging as well as mobile sites. You can find a list of these locations by visiting redcross.ca. I want to say thank you once again to British Columbians for keeping themselves and their neighbours safe. And all workers and volunteers who have been engaged in the tireless efforts to respond to and recover from these storms. While the recovery phase of this event is just getting going and there is still much to do, we are making progress every day and we will get through this together. Lastly, but just as importantly, I want to thank the First Nations and local government leaders who have been vital in keeping our communities together and the Ministry of Transportation and Infrastructure crews, Emergency Management BC staff and the many volunteers and public safety partners who have been working around the clock to get us back on our feet. We all owe them a very big thank you. And with that, I'll pass this update over to Minister Fleming.
Thank you so much, uh, Minister Farnworth, and uh, good afternoon. Uh, today I'll be providing uh, you with an update on what may well be one of the most remarkable engineering feats in recent memory in the province of British Columbia, of a, a story of highway engineering and reconstruction uh, that is unfolding on a day-by-day -day basis. I'm referring to the round-the-clock work uh, to get the Coquihalla Highway back in operation after it was heavily damaged in that historic storm just 31 days ago. As British Columbians know by now, over 20 separate sites along the corridor were severely impacted, in, including sections of the roadway that completely collapsed and multiple bridges that also collapsed. As I've outlined before, the response by our maintenance contractors, our subcontractors, our engineers to get the Coquihalla Highway open is, is as unprecedented as the storms that damaged it in the first place. Working around the clock in very challenging conditions, crews have been quickly completing repair work. This will allow traffic to once again move along the Highway 5 corridor while the permanent repairs that are planned and carried, back, carried out as we build back better uh, are undertaken. But today I am very pleased to announce that the Coquihalla will reopen to essential traffic no later than the end of day on Monday, December the 20th. The exact time of day will be determined over the next few days as we complete some final pieces of work that are needed uh, for that reopening uh, to get completed, including some paving. Uh, the vehicles authorized to use the Coquihalla will be commercial trucks and intercity buses. This will help allow for the tra safe transportation of goods and services to people and communities across the province. And I want to now take the time to introduce Paula Cousins, who is our Executive Director for the Southern Interior Region. She's going to walk us through some of the technical details uh, of the work, the remarkable work that's taken place along that corridor. She was uh, out on the Coquihalla on Friday with some members of the media. Uh, she has a further update today. Uh, she's helped lead the teams that completed this amazing task. And I'm so proud of her work and her team's work. And uh, I'll turn it over to you now, Paula. Thank you, Minister, and good day, everyone. I'm very pleased to speak about the work that's been completed so far on reopening the Coquihalla. Before I go into details, I really would like to echo Minister Fleming's gratitude for all the people who have worked tirelessly to get us here today, including the ministry team, contractors, and every individual who's contributed. The Coquihalla Highway between Hope and Merritt experienced damage or washouts along 130 kilometers of the corridor during the November 14th and 15th atmospheric river event. Damage included 14 sites where lanes were completely wiped out or significantly undermined. Seven impacted bridge structures where spans collapsed or were compromised by scour and erosion. And five debris flow events. The past month has been a massive mobilization of people and equipment. Our contractors quickly set to work with ministry engineers, project managers and operations staff to assess the damage and formulate a plan for getting the Coke functional again. To date, these massive collaborative efforts have resulted in a highway corridor that will be ready to support essential commercial travel by Monday. Our efforts have included over 200 pieces of equipment working, over 300 people working around the clock. We've moved over 400,000 cubic meters of fill, and that's equivalent to lining up dump trucks all the way from Hope to Kamloops, bumper to bumper. And we've blasted over 130,000 cubic meters of rock, which is enough to fill over 50 Olympic-sized swimming pools. A few key factors have accelerated our response and contributed to the, the significant advancement of our schedule. We immediately activated equipment and crews following this event, and that quickly enabled us to achieve access to cutoff sections, getting crews working at multiple sites. Just last week, we were able to get across Carolyn Bridge in the south and Bottle Top Bridge in the north, which allowed us to rapidly accelerate work across the corridor. We've generally had favorable weather conditions for this mountain pass, and the complete dedication of everyone involved with the response has been nothing short of heroic. Throughout it all, safety remained our highest priority, and we're proud to say that there have been no safety-related incidents. I'll now walk through a few of the key sites just to show the progress we've made to get temporary access restored. This is what the Othello area looked like right after the event. The entire southbound lanes were eroded along with portions of the northbound fast lane. And now we have two lanes reestablished and the bank has been armored and protected. 
These are the Jessica bridges right after the event. And as you can see, both bridge approaches were wiped out. And these are the Jessica bridges now. Crews have constructed a lock block wall and installed a temporary span. And while work will continue after we open, access in the southbound direction will be complete by Monday's opening. At Juliet, a southbound span collapsed and the northbound bridge was significantly undermined. And now we've armored the embankment, secured the abutment and the northbound structure is ready to receive traffic. Three spans collapsed at the bottle top bridge and a section of the road was also washed away. And over the past month, we've installed a temporary span to provide access over the southbound lanes and paved the approach. Hundreds of meters of southbound lanes were washed out at Murray Flats and the northbound fast lane was also partially eroded. And this is what it looks like now. We're armoring and rebuilding the southbound lanes, which will be ready to open on Monday. And work continues on further armoring and rebuilding the northbound lanes to open that segment to four lanes in the weeks following the initial opening. At Mine Creek, four separate locations were washed away. And this week we're installing bigger culverts to increase the drainage capacity and work is on track to have this section of the highway reestablished to four lanes by Monday. So in summary, and as Minister Fleming said, a lot of work has been done to get the highway ready to receive commercial traffic again. We still have a lot to do and work will be continuing in the coming weeks while commercial traffic begins moving through the corridor. And while we are thrilled to reopen the Coquihalla Highway, it is not the Coquihalla as we know it. When open, some sections will be open to two lane traffic only with one lane in each direction. There will be several speed reductions and crossovers along the route. And we anticipate that it will take up to an additional 45 minutes to get through this segment in optimal weather conditions. Given the priority to get this route open, there are a few items that we want to ensure those using the route are prepared for. There will be no power. BC Hydro is working hard to restore service, but it will not be done in time for Monday. So until power is restored, commercial drivers can expect limited lighting in the snow sheds and at brake checks and chain up areas using generators. The variable speed system will not be in service. There will be portable toilets available, but not the full service washrooms. There will be a reduced cell coverage along the route and electron, electronic vehicle charging stations will not be functional. On the operating front, commercial drivers can expect reduced speed limits along the corridor. It'll be 100 kilometers an hour in four lane sections and 60 kilometers an hour in crossovers and two lane sections. There will be increased chain up requirements, increased winter maintenance and monitoring, and increased CVSE enforcement. So in closing, we've done everything possible to restore access to this corridor, but keeping it open will require everyone to do their part, including carrying proper chains and using them when the chain of lights are on, following the posted speeds, driving to conditions, and avoiding passing in the two lane sections and crossovers. A map is being produced to show the lane reductions and changes to the corridor, and it will be posted to our social media accounts prior to the corridor reopening. And at that, I'll pass it back to Minister Fleming. Great. Thank you so much, Paula. And as you can see, the pace of uh, repair has been absolutely staggering. A lot has even changed since I was on site just five days ago, and we will need the next few days to complete some additional work, paving sections of the highway. But uh, again, an incredible testament to the workers of this province uh, who've been involved in repairing the Coquihalla. This is a significant milestone for our supply chains that will have economic benefits for all British Columbians who've seen supply chain interruptions and, and indeed for a connection to the rest of the country. Um, just want to reiterate what Paula said though, it won't be traffic as usual until the permanent repairs can happen. We'll have uh, more information about that in the new year. Um, but uh, what you, you can see what we will gain is a much more efficient and safer highway for the majority of semi-trucks um, to be on the number five and this will allow traffic volumes on Highway 3 to return to more normal volumes. So I want to talk a little bit about Highway 3. When the Coquihalla does reopen, we will remove the essential travel designation for Highway 3 about 24 hours later. So Coquihalla opening on Monday, date, uh, time to be confirmed. 24 hours later, Highway 3, the uh, essential travel restrictions will be lifted. 
Uh, and while this increased mobility is clearly good news, we're advising people to use extreme caution on Highway 3. It's a safe route as long as people are prepared, responsible, and drive to the conditions, but it's a mountainous route. Uh, it has steep grades, it has winding curves, and the weather and road conditions can change quite quickly. Uh, we're going to continue to have enhanced winter maintenance, uh, improved signage, and additional police and CVSC enforcement along the number three. Um, people who are not experienced with winter driving in the mountains are encouraged to use alternatives, though. I want to be clear about that if they're traveling between the lower mainland and the interior. The airlines have put on extra flights, capped the prices. Inner city buses will be using the Coquihalla as of Monday the 20th, so there are other options besides driving the number three for those who have never really driven in winter conditions. Um, for those of you who do need to drive, you must have good winter tires. You should pack food and blankets, have a fully charged cell phone, take some of those precautions and be prepared to be uh, patient. Um, slow down, drive carefully and drive to the road conditions. I want to just move to the Highway 99 uh, uh, now because it's been under essential orders. When the Coquihalla reopens, the section of 99 that's been restricted between Pemberton and Lillooet will also be open to general travel. So this will occur a day sooner than Highway 3. Commercial vehicles still not allowed on, on the 99 uh, on that part of the route. Uh, but again, the same cautions apply here as they do on uh, Highway 3. People need to ensure that they and their vehicles are prepared for winter conditions. Uh, vehicles larger than the cube truck will still be banned between Pemberton and Lillooet. And this ban will remain in effect until we get temporary repairs completed on Highway 1 through the Fra Fraser Canyon, which will then give large trucks a more direct route uh, to the north part of the province. Uh, Highway 1 uh, repairs through the Fraser Canyon are continuing. There are 18 impacted sites between Hope and Spence's Bridge. Currently 12 of those sites have been opened or have a detour in place. Uh, work is continuing on four sites where significant damage occurred. We're still holding to the timeline that uh, Minister Farnworth and I announced at an earlier briefing that by mid-January we expect Highway 1 to be reopened. There will be some single lane sections and there will be slower speeds to accommodate uh, the temporary uh, works and the ongoing construction. Just a very brief update on Highway 8 as well. This was heavily damaged. We are now working to clear and repair five sites between the, the Nakuala Recreation Site and the Shack and Indian Reserve. First Nations uh, cultural and archaeological monitors are working at all five of these locations. Uh, it's good news that BC Hydro has restored power to residents between Merritt and Shacken on the north side with work continuing to fully restore power uh, throughout the area. We don't have an estimated date of reopening yet for Highway 8. It will take significant time to repair the very extensive damage. Let me just say in closing that uh, having an opening day for the Coquihalla closing, uh, close at hand is a turning point for our province and our recovery efforts from these historic devastating storms and I again want to extend my sincere thanks and appreciation for all of those who's gotten us to this point. The companies, the trade unions, the engineers, the suppliers, the workers who've been on the ground working day and night literally around the clock. Uh, with the work you have done has been inspiring and very selfless and dedicated on behalf of all the rest of the British Columbians that you're serving and I also want to thank uh, people, the people of this province who've been patient, they've been adaptable, they've been understandable as we've worked our way back a huge thank you to them, and I'd like to invite my colleague, Agriculture Minister Lana Popham, to provide her update. Thank you. Good afternoon. Thanks for joining us today. On the agricultural side, we have been turning our mind to cleanup and recovery. As of yesterday, we are down to about 30 farms that are still in the evacuation order zone. Uh, this is coming down from over 1,000, and so that's moving in the right direction. As people return to their farms and their homes, um, there's been some very difficult days for folks. The, the destruction that's happened uh, is significant, and they're trying to figure out how to move forward at this time, and our thoughts are with them. The process of cleaning farms is uh, a difficult one. It's almost uh, a question of where do you start. Um, everything is covered in a really uh, bad mud right now, and so just being able to have access to clean water to wash away that debris is challenging for these folks. Um, also, the disposal of animal mortalities is has uh, has improved. Last week was a, a big week for that, and that's been in partnership with our ministry, with industry associations and private businesses. And I'd like to thank everyone taking part in that um, very difficult uh, situation, but we are making progress there. 
There are plans to assess the conditions of the soil in the areas that have been flooded and we'll be implementing those assessments in the coming weeks. This is going to be really important as farmers are going to have to make decisions about um, this coming growing season. What needs to be replanted, what can be planted and how does the soil have to be remediated. This is all in question for many folks right now and it's um, it's quite overwhelming but as we see those assessments come back we'll have path forward. Uh, paths forward for folks to to move ahead. The um, I think the tone out there from farmers is that they just want to get back to work as soon as possible and so part of that is um, assessing the damage and being able to give them the financial supports that they need to rebuild. The tour that I had with Federal Minister Bebo last Friday was critically important as we kind of tie down um, the final details on our agri-recovery program that's being developed. Uh, one thing I think that was very important for Minister Bebo to see is that we've got a situation uh, with from one end of the spectrum to the other. So there's uh, chicken farmers right now in the Sumas Prairie that are back into production almost fully. They've hobbled together some of their barns and um, they're making it work. Um, to the other end of the spectrum where we see large scale vegetable production that is absolutely in some cases still under a lot of water and of course this layer of mud. And so uh, every farm is going to be a, a different situation and we want to make sure that nobody's falling through the cracks as we develop this program. So having these on the ground visits, it's, it's critically important. We are having cross sectoral round tables to make sure also we don't leave anybody out. I think next Monday we're having one with the blueberry industry who's very concerned about their plants and the state of their plants right now. Um, I know that some blueberry plants, if they're older, they're, they have a better chance of surviving but we have a lot of new plantings that won't make it and so it'll be I, I have had many conversations with blueberry farmers and the processors but to be able to have a round table with them on Monday is going to be able to give them some good information on on what they need to prepare as they they move forward as far as uh, applications to different programs but also you know there might be some information that that we don't know yet that we're really eager to to find out from them and so I'm looking forward to that meeting. I'm going to be out uh, back out in the Fraser Valley this week. I'm going to be uh, touring a vegetable farm, uh, one of the land-based fish farms that was destroyed and also a blueberry processing plant that is quite a high-tech plant and unfortunately has had water damage in some of its equipment and so um, that'll allow us to also have a, b a better look at some of the processing that's been damaged out there which is, is significant. Um, we want to make sure right now that we're addressing things that are urgent and one of the things that continues to be urgent is being able to feed the livestock. We'll have more details in the days ahead uh, but we will be releasing two programs that will ease up on the burden of uh, livestock producers right now as they look towards the winter with limited feed. I can say that we've secured a um, million dollars in funding to help fill this immediate need of hay and forage. The funding of course is for emergency feed and those who are in the immediate, uh, for those in the immediate term. Um, we're trying to avoid any animal welfare issues and so uh, as soon as that application is available we'll be making sure that folks who need it will get it into their hands. We are working closely with the BC Forage Council and the BC Cattlemen's Association to make sure that this information gets disseminated uh, as much as possible. We know that there's folks up in the Merritt area that are really struggling with the urgency of this feed and so the conversations with them, um, I can say that we are, be, we are able to secure feed and we will be able to move it in there but um, we'll be able, need to reach out to them and get them to fill out some of those applications but we'll be working with them. What I can say to all farmers right now that have been affected by floods, I can't tell you how important it is right now to be holding on to any receipts recording any expenses that you've incurred since the floods and making sure that you've got the records and even um, a photo journal would help. So as we, uh, as these agri recovery applications come forward, we're going to need all the information that you've gathered since those floods happened. So um, that's probably the best way that you can be prepared for that coming up in the next few weeks. Finally, I'll just finish off by talking about the resiliency of our BC farmers. It continues to just amaze me. 
We're already seeing farmers restarting production as in the dairy industry. So 48 out of 60 dairy farms in the Fraser Valley have resumed production, which means that milk production, milk supply is at 95% of normal. I'd like to tell you quickly about Richard Bosma and his family who have a, da have a dairy out on the Sumas Prairie in the valley. They farm about 200 dairy cows and they've been operating in the valley for most of their lives. When they started, when the floods uh, began, they started to move their cows out. There was about 100 moved before they were, they had to take a break, um, which left about 100 cows left in the, the barns. When Richard returned the next day, he didn't know if he should expect them to be dead or alive, but they had survived, so the rescue continued. And those cows continued to be trailered out over the day and brought to buddy farms in the, in the area. One of the things that was in the back of Richard's mind was that he knew that there was one cow that was ready to calf, but the urgency was to move all of the cows as soon as possible so he couldn't focus in on that one cow. As the cows were placed on the buddy farms in the following hours, that particular cow arrived onto its host farm, immediately laid down and had a baby heifer calf. And at that point, volunteers started to attend to the health of that calf. Richard and his family named her Miracle and she'll be returning home on Saturday to her home farm. I asked Richard what it felt like not to have any of those animals in his barns. His barns are empty at the moment. And he said he's never really had a moment like that. And how he said how overwhelming it's going to be when those animals start to arrive back this week. So we wish them luck with that. The Buddy Farm system made all the difference. In the dairy industry during the disaster, a lot of farmers put their needs ahead, their community needs ahead of their own needs. And that means they were sharing feed. And so that's another issue that we're going to have to address is making sure those dairy farmers can get through the winter. All of this is the hope that we need as our farmers continue to recover. We need to continue to support them and to show our gratitude for providing food to us, the food that we put on all of our tables. And one of the best ways that you can do that right now is to buy BC. Thank you. Thank you very much. A reminder to media on the line, please press star one to enter the queue. You'll be limited to one question and one follow-up. Our first question today comes from Richard Zussman, Global News. Uh, Minister Fleming, just trying to get a better sense of what Highway 3 is going to look like. Um, what uh, are you going to be looking at over those 24 hours once the Coca Cola reopens? And what sort of travel? Like, is this a message to anyone to say, okay, now you can get on the three and travel, you know, to and from the interior for Metro Vancouver. Is there any additional guidance around that? Sure. Yeah, thank you. So, um, as I mentioned, one of the reasons why we'll um, stagger the uh, lifting of essential travel uh, restrictions on the number three uh, about 24 hours after we open up the number five is to give the trucking industry and various um, routes and deliveries that they've booked uh, a period of time to, to migrate back to the number five because we want the five to be the overwhelming uh, commercial truck route for the province. Um, it'll be much faster for them, more direct. That's where drivers want to be. So I, I, I expect the industry, and we've already communicated with the BC Trucking Association and others in the industry that this is our plan uh, going forward. So, but just making sure that, you know, Immediately, we don't have the mixing of large commercial semis with um, passenger vehicles on day one. So we'll give a day's adjustment period there and also just do additional inspections on the road. And um, we're going to have a enhanced RCMP enforcement and checkpoints uh, on both the Highway 3 and the 5. So mobilizing some additional resources as well. My advice, though, to the traveling public is this is, while this is good news in terms of mobility, um, we have to be mindful of a number of things. And I talked about Highway 3 being a tough highway to traverse for passenger vehicles in winter conditions. It's steep, it's windy. Um, there's, there's work crews out there. Um, and we hope that the volumes are not um, excessive. And we hope that British Columbians, we expect British Columbians, because this is we've been in this pandemic now for more than 18 months, um, while there's no essential travel orders restrictions uh, as it relates to the pandemic at this point, people have to be paying attention to public health advice a lot. 
and holiday gatherings in the fourth wave and um, you know not traveling if not needed to I, I know a number of people are already adjusted their travel plans um, because of the storm event and the restricted access to our highways um, you know you should maybe stick with the plans that you had to make uh, since November 15th when when the province changed in that regard and uh, and as I said uh, pay attention to public health advice that's coming on a daily basis as the Omicron variant uh, is appearing in clusters in different parts of the province. Do you have a follow-up, Richard? Ms. I think you alluded to this. I know commercial trucks and essential vehicles will be making their decisions, but will there still be commercial vehicles will be allowed to go on both the Coquihalla or Highway 3 once the Coquihalla is reopened, or will uh, the advice be to send everything on the Coquihalla commercially uh, and not on Highway 3? Yes, trucks will still be able to use the three because there's a number of communities where they're making deliveries there. Uh, but the number three typically experiences a, a significantly, vastly lower uh, volume of commercial trucks um, than the number five. So if we've been experiencing a total flow of about 3,000 trucks on the number three, I would expect perhaps 85, 90% of that to use the Coquihalla. That's certainly what the trucking industry is expecting. So. You'll, you'll, you'll see it go from 3,000 a day to perhaps just a couple hundred um, on, on the uh, Hope Princeton Highway. Next question, we go to Mira Baines, CBC. Okay. Uh, this question is for Minister Fleming. When can we expect some uh, updates on the financial costs of the infrastructure repair work? And uh, is there any timeline on the when the Coquihalla might be reopened to all traffic, like even a rough estimate, uh, spring or summer? Yeah, let me start with the second question first. Um, the important thing about reopening the five and, and Paula in the briefing there talked about the speed limit. So it will be free flowing and parts of the highway are in good condition, 100 kilometer an hour speed limits. But in the uh, areas that have been damaged or where there's lane constrictions, it would be 50 to 60 kilometers an hour. We're going to be monitoring this for performance, for volumes. Um, you know, this is this is an extremely welcome development for our supply chains and everybody that depends on them. All the employment and the goods and services that uh, can get throughout communities in our economy. Um, but uh, the performance uh, monitoring of how the number five performs will determine what restrictions will uh, lift uh, and and when. So I can't answer that today. On the cost of the repairs. We're still working on that. We're still, um, you know, it, it, it's uh, determined by, you know, design and um, the engineering advice of what Build Back Better looks like. We've had some excellent discussions with our supply chain working group, which is Transport Canada, my ministry, and the private sector and everybody involved in goods movement in BC. Um, we've got a really good under, understanding um, from the federal government on, on the damage uh, that we've sustained and they've pledged their support. Um, so we'll have those sorts of things in, 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 in the new year. But, but for now, we're, as I said before, we're not sparing resources. We've thrown everything we've had at this, 300 workers working around the clock, 200 pieces of heavy equipment on the Coquihalla. Um, I mean, there's a huge economic cost uh, every day that our infrastructure is down and not performing and supply chains are interrupted. So um, it, it, we, we did this uh, because British Columbians were cut off from one another, but it's, there's also economic reasons we, we, we wanted to uh, have this restored as quickly as possible. Mira, do you have a follow-up? Yeah, um, Minister, I'm just wondering about the timeline for Highway 1 through the Fraser Canyon. You said, you know, it, it's still mid-January. Could we see that um, that work move along uh, quickly, like the Coquihalla? Is there a possibility that it could be open uh, earlier than that? That's the timeline we have right now. That hasn't changed. We've got a lot of uh, work crews there. Uh, it's very similar to the Coquihalla effort. Um, damage very extensive as well. Um, Twelve sites are sort of remediated or side routes um, are available to, to connect, but the route is not um, likely to be um, able to, from one end of it to the other, uh, through the Fraser Canyon, be able to be continuous until, until mid-January. Uh, so there are about five active sites, 12 completed or near completed, five active sites that need to be worked 
on in the next few weeks to get us to mid-January. Next question, Victor Kaiser, Radio NL. Hi, Minister Fleming. Uh, thanks for doing this. I just wanted to, uh, you know, double check that when the Coquihalla does open, you know, potentially, uh, will there be, first of all, you know, potential roadblocks just keeping non-essential vehicles away? And also, I guess it'll be at Merit and at Hope, really. And also, how confident are you, perhaps, in the repairs that they've been done once they see that volume of traffic, as you mentioned, uh, they'll be able to hold up, given uh, how notorious the Coke is in uh, winter months? Yeah. Yeah, thank you for that. So you're exactly right. There will be um, checkpoints at both the Hope and Merit ends to the Coquihalla to make sure that uh, it's for uh, essential purposes only, that the orders are being enforced. We'll have CVSE enhanced enforcement. There'll be a big ministry presence on the Highway 5 corridor and the Highway 3 corridor. Um, we will have enhanced uh, road maintenance uh, contractors as well um, in plowing and making sure that the conditions uh, on the road are um, uh, cleared up when we have weather events. Um, the other part of your question was, sorry, remind me again. Uh, it, it was uh, on will just it making withhold? sure yes. that you know how confident. Yes, yeah. yes. Well, as you saw in the in, in the in the pictures that uh, uh, Paula Cousins shared from the ministry, um, the amount of armoring and reinforcement and the engineered solutions. These are temporary fixes, but they're they're very strong um, and very fortified, and uh, we had no interruptions even as supply chains were generally strained in the province. We had no, we had no supply interruptions around uh, the kind of material that we needed for this rebuild. So the, quite frankly, the dynamic was one that we can all be proud of. It was contractors moving equipment, uh, all hands on deck approach, people want, with experience in road builders, careers in road building, wanting to work on this project and to get it done. Uh, and. You know, I don't think it would be realistic before Christmas, but um, because we enhanced the schedule, made it scheduled shifts to be around the clock, um, those workers are going to get some well-deserved days off uh, after December 20th when we get it reopened, but they've worked to make it uh, safe and, and, and strong, and it will be engineered to be uh, a good temporary fix on all the damaged areas. Victor, do you have a follow-up? I'm good, thanks. Thank you very much. For the next question, we go to Barbara Roden, Ashcroft Journal. Uh, thank you very much. Can you hear me? We yes. Can you hear me? Can do, yes. We can. Please go ahead, Barbara. Thank you. Uh, a follow-up about the Highway 1 question. I think everyone understands the need to get the Coquihalla up and running as a vital communications chain, but cannot some of that equipment and manpower be switched over to Highway 1, bearing in mind that hundreds of people live along that corridor who are now effectively cut off and it's a several hours trip over bad roads in winter to get to necessary um, necessary things like uh, medical treatment, for example. Uh, so is there any chance that that mid-January date can be moved forward? Well, I hope so. I can't do that today, but I can tell you that the collaboration between different crews working on different parts of our damaged highway system um, is seamless. Uh, so we have, uh, we've had many jobs going on in many different affected parts of the province all at once so it's not the case that we didn't mobilize on highway one in order to mobilize on highway five we mobilized for both of those highways number eight as well and number 99 and the number one on vancouver island in the early uh, aftermath of the storm so it's been all available labor companies road maintenance contractors everybody has been thrown into the fight at all the sites that were damaged after the storm event barbara do you have a follow-up uh, yes, this is regarding uh, sort of the Highway 8 question and, and the people in Spences Bridge particularly and along that stretch of highway. Uh, this is the second time um, this year that they've been evacuated, this time uh, for heaven knows how long. And I know that Minister Farnworth visited the area last week. And what I'm hearing from people in Spences Bridge is that it would mean a lot to them, um, a lot to them, to their stress levels, their mental health levels, because they are at the breaking point. They would love to see someone uh, from the province actually come to the community announced and speak with them and just reassure them that they're not forgotten. Uh, would there be any plans for something like that, uh, a visit? 
Uh, we have been out um, uh, in different parts of the province visiting uh, the, uh, the, the affected communities. Uh, we will be continuing to do that. But what I can tell you is no part of the province is being forgotten. No community is being forgotten. That's why the, uh, the trip out uh, there was, uh, initially it was delayed. Uh, we went the next day. Uh, we managed to get as far as hope. Um, again, weather uh, was almost going to end the trip, uh, but we felt it was uh, critical to get out to, uh, to, to Highway 8 uh, and communities along there that we ended up taking the, uh, the uh, a route uh, up through Harrison coming out the back. It did uh, cut short the trip, but I can tell you uh, that uh, absolutely no community uh, is being forgotten. Uh, that's why we have uh, the joint working group with the federal government uh, that has announced the, uh, the five uh, uh, billion dollars uh, that was announced by the federal government uh, yesterday uh, in terms of uh, recovery. Um, it's why we have extended the supports uh, in place uh, for, uh, for uh, communities uh, that have, where people have been uh, evacuated uh, to continue uh, into the spring as today that's taken over by the, uh, the Red Cross. So that, that all that significant work ensuring that, uh, that uh, the province has the back of communities is absolutely going to continue. Next question, Mike Hager, Globe and Mail. Hi, thanks for taking uh, my question. I am curious if uh, Mr. Farnworth can um, explain how much of the federal aid will go toward um, helping people whose homes were destroyed. Um, do you have a sense of kind of the damage to housing and um, how that may affect affordability uh, in these communities? So um, I'll, I can make a, a couple of uh, points around that. So the federal government made the announcement yesterday uh, we have the joint committee uh, that is meeting and, uh, and working very cooperatively uh, to deal with the, the critical issues that are facing people who have been evacuated. Uh, my officials and will be meeting with federal officials now to determine uh, the specific details and specific issues that may need to be worked out over the, uh, the coming few, the next few weeks, ensuring alignment of the province's disaster financial assistance with the federal uh, disaster financial assistance arrangement. And we all recognize the need uh, that there needs to be flexibility. So I've been really pleased uh, about that. Uh, at the same time, the uh, the rapid and uh, damage assessments on uh, communities where uh, and neighborhoods that have been uh, and properties that have been evacuated or were evacuated is underway, uh, and that uh, that assessment of those properties is going to help inform uh, uh, the understanding of just how much the uh, the damage is and the uh, the potential costs around that. Uh, that does take some time, but what I can tell you. Uh, is that significant work has already been underway, particularly in the, uh, the Merritt area, uh, as well as in Princeton, uh, and, uh, and, and significant work has already been accomplished uh, in, uh, in Abbotsford with some more still to do. Do you have a follow-up, Mike? Uh, yes, and Mr. Fleming, with um, Highway 3 reopening to all traffic uh, next week, hopefully, um, what is the message you're sending to people who want to travel within BC for the holidays? Yeah, the message is think very carefully about that um, for two reasons. Um, these highways have been damaged. We're in winter conditions, which are tough driving conditions on their own. Highway 3 is a route most people are not terribly familiar with. Um, it's steep. It's windy. Um, so uh you know you should you should have a good vehicle and you should be experienced driving in winter conditions you should pack food emergency blankets have your cell phone charged if you're going to do that um but also look at some alternatives too uh the regional airlines the national airlines have added significant amounts of flights they've brought in price caps and i'm aware that westjet and air canada have perhaps others which is good um the uh, inner city bus operators are back up and running. There's three of them on the number three. Uh, I, sus I, su I su suspect most of them will prefer the number five because it'll be much faster. Those, those kind of, uh, that's an affordable mode of, of travel from the interior to the lower mainland that uh, pay attention to all the companies that are going to be operating there. They'll have schedule and fees um, available. Um, the other thing is, of course, to be very mindful of the public health crisis going on. Uh, we have, uh, case counts uh, seven day average that is up from where it was um, previously um, having gone down I think for 30 days in a row um, so uh, 
you know, that there'd be national travel advice, and, and I expect the provincial health officer and Minister Dix uh, will be giving advice as well based on what's happening in the fourth wave of this pandemic. But um, for sure, uh, holiday gatherings are, are um, you know, I think something that people should really think very carefully about. I, th I think you've, we've heard Dr. Henry say, you know, stay local if you can. And, uh, and uh, I think that's, well, that is my advice as well. Thank you very much, Minister. That concludes today's update.